party with your host, Dustin Ripka. Hello and welcome to Sex Party. I'm your host, Dustin Ribka. With me on the show this week, she's a certified sex therapist, a relationship specialist, neuroscience researcher, and an author. She's Dr. Nan Wise. And Dr. Nan Wise knows what goes on in your brain when you have an orgasm, when you feel sexual arousal, when you feel sexual pleasure, right? She knows what that looks like in your brain. How does she know this? Because her and a couple dozen other people climbed into an fMRI machine and masturbated, had orgasms in the name of science to get this groundbreaking research. We're going to talk about that. We're going to touch on polyamory. Um, but really, the, the meat of this episode lies in how your core emotions, feelings have an overall effect, whether you realize it or not, on your well-being, anxiety, depression, all of the the, the pleasure we have, the pleasure we could have, our relationships with other people, and this crazy, crazy world that we live in where no one has an attention span. How do we combat that? How do we do something different? How do we make better relationships? How do we have better sex? She is going to tell us this episode is loaded with value. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Nan Wise. This week's conversation. conversation. Dr. Nan Wise, how are you? Welcome to Sex Party. I'm so excited to be here. I am really psyched and pumped, Dustin. Well, I'm glad because I am psyched and pumped. Um, you know, we're we're psyched and pumped all the time, but more so when we have a guest like you on the show. Um, we talked a little bit back and forth in email. We talked a little bit um, just now. We we're running through the technical difficulties of doing a podcast, which nobody seems to know about. If you don't do a podcast, we will save you the, the the whole thing. But it's listen, we're here today for you guys that are listening, that are watching, because we love you and we want you to have a better sex life. We want to have better relationships. It's a hard, it's a hard uh, sell out there. It's a hard world out there. So we are here to make it easy. But we just want you to know how difficult it is sometimes. Okay. So, so with that being said, um, for the people who don't know you, they, they have no idea what's going on. They already don't like me because of the long introduction, <laughs> right? Could you talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I think I'm the only person out there who's both a sex therapist and a sex neuroscience researcher and then add uh, like a triple threat. I'm a relationship specialist and I've been at this for a long time. And I love the idea, Dustin, that you want people to really get the importance of sex, relationship, connection, fun, play, party, because it's like the most important thing, I think, for the quality of our lives is that we can experience pleasure in our bodies with each other. And this, this is a very challenging time. We know that the younger people, Gen Z, are really having a very hard time. And I talk about this in my book. I'm author of Why Good Sex Matters, Understanding the Neuroscience of Pleasure for a Smarter, Happier, and More Purpose-Filled Life. So how I got into this business is that I came into this world with a very panicky nervous system. So I had a tendency towards anxiety. It was also complicated by childhood stress, which is my next book. All right. Childhood trauma, why it's never too late to have a happy childhood and here's how. Mm. But my book, Why Good Sex Matters, uses our the win our relationship with sexuality is a window into how well our emotional brain body is working. So I had a challenge myself. I had panic attacks that were pretty awful. And my whole career has been a personal and professional journey to figure out how I could work my own nervous system better, how I could have a happier, um, more productive life. And I've done pretty darn good. I mean, mm -hmm. when I think about what I've accomplished in my life, there's no way that I had the map that I was going to accomplish what I did. 
And I was in the midst of all this, able to create a relationship that is 50 years old. Mm. It's, it's unbelievable that I could be in a relationship <laughs> for 50 years. It started in high school and we have two children and we have five grandchildren. So my whole purpose in what I go out there and do for people is teaching them how to work the brain mind better. And with the goal of creating more balance in our emotions and more pleasure in our relationships, including our sexual selves. Okay. So this is my mission. This is what gets me out of bed every day. And I can't say it's always been easy, but I will tell you that. Working on myself, my credibility story, in addition to being able to go back to school at the age of 50 and do a PhD in neuroscience, which I never thought I could do. (laughs) By the time I wrote this book and I went on the Today Show, which was the week that New York shut down with COVID, talk about a book launch, (laughs) I was able, I was able to not only not have uh, public speaking anxiety. I went on that show and I had such a good time being interviewed by Maria Shriver. And there was a wonderful gynecologist. We were talking about the importance of uh, women's pleasure. And then we got hijacked by this shit show of COVID. And we're, Mm. you know, it's just been one thing after another. So I love to talk to people. I love to get people curious about their own capacity for having a better relationship with themselves and then creating sustainable relationships in their lives. Being able to have sustainable relationship. I'm not saying you should, you know, marry somebody and stay married for the rest of your lives because, you know, if it's not working, it's not working. But what we can learn is that we human beings can connect with each other and Learn tools so that we have more effective relationships. And the more effective we are in relationship, the happier we're going to be. So this is not like pleasure is a luxury. Mm. The pleasure signals that we get are really meant to work with these embodied emotions to move us toward things that we need, you know, towards things that hopefully feel good and are good for us, which is a whole other story now, how we've gotten hijacked by faux pleasures and away from things that are destructive to us. So Mm -hmm. the healthy hedonism, things that feel good and are good for us, connection, play, you know, going deep with people, being connected with ourselves and each other is so important for long-term well-being. For yeah. our physical well-being, not just our sure. emotional. It's all one thing. Right. And I feel like, you know, a lot of people miss that that point that when you're in a relationship with someone or you're looking to be in a relationship with someone, that pleasure is a big component of the relationship. And it is important not just because somebody wants to bust a nut or get off or, you know, squirt or whatever. I could go on forever with the with, with the different names for it and the and the actions, right? But I, I think people forget just how important it is for yourself and for your partner or partners um, in a day-to-day capacity. I think that that they just think, well, it's hot and heavy in the beginning and then we lose the spark and, you know, maybe we, you know, do this or that to bring it back. I mean, could you talk a little bit about maybe just right here at the tip of the iceberg, right? Just like how important it is to be, enter a relationship, be in a relationship and realize that, your pleasure and your partner or your partners, if you're in a polyamorous situation, everyone's pleasure is really, really important to the actual fiber of the relationship. Relationships need to be rewarding and reinforcing. And we need skills to be able to navigate that. So in the early phases of relationship, there's something called new relationship energy. And it's actually a chemical explosion in your brain. Mm -hmm. And nature wired us to have that kind of experience. Often in new relationships, it gets our attention on the partner. And we're obsessed with the partner. When that goes sideways, it can be a place of a lot of pain when we ruminate, worry, and all that. 
But that time period, which is about 18 to 36 months when you are so jazzed up, you want to, you think about the partner, you want to be all over the partner. That is designed in a way to help us focus on that person enough to do the work of bonding. And bonding is, do we have, are we on the same page? Do we have the same vision for our lives? Are we compatible, both in and out of the bedroom? And what bothers me, and I wish I had one penny for each time people say to me, I'm not in love anymore. My head wants to explode. When they're talking about being in love, they're misidentifying the new relationship energy with love. It's infatuation. It's not being in love. What, they're, what they are is they're in lust. So when that goes away, what we need to concentrate on is all of the good things that we can bring to the partner. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about polyamory. Would you be surprised to know that I was one of the first people going out and being transparent about my own polyamory at the time, my husband and I? Um, you know, I, I don't know that I would be, I don't think, I don't think anything surprises me on this show where we're, we're past the 120th episode. So, so no, but I, I love where this is going. Well, what happened was my husband and I were married. We, we met when we were in high school. So it's like 50 years ago. Um, we had basically about 20 years of monogamy from the time that we were in our late teens with a couple of exceptions when we were away at school, when you mm -hmm. live on different, in different places. But anyway, we <laughs> realized that we had the capacity to be able to connect with other people. And we actually um, got connected with another couple and they were the ones who were sort of like driving that energy. And my husband and I were like, is this really a thing? The word polyamory did not exist back then. It was, they called it basically swinging because swinging mm -hmm. can also encompass anything from, you know, people just in it for the sex to people who have long-term relationships. They didn't have the word polyamory. Right. So what I'd like to say is there's lots of ways that you can do healthy relationships. It's not just one size fits all. And if you're going to venture into something like polyamory, which is really a little bit more challenging, because there's a lot of things that you deal with in polyamory that you don't in normal monogamy, or as my one of my gestalt teachers used to call it monotony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You need tools and skills. You need to know, for example, in, in polyamory, you need to learn how to manage new relationship energy. Mm -hmm. So you're not just going to run off with the shiny new person who shows up. You know, the way I know there's a million different ways people think about polyamory and they probably like, you know, haven't even heard of me, although I was one of the first people that would go out as a psychotherapist and talk about it on TV programs and stuff, because it used to piss me off <laughs> that people made assumptions that there was something wrong with my marriage because we mm. were, we opened it up. There was something wrong with me as a parent. People made a lot of assumptions. So kind of coming back to the importance of relationship is like realizing that you can learn how to navigate whether you, when you lose new relationship energy, because that will happen. We habituate to each other. Mm -hmm. I My heart does not beat fast every time my husband walks into the room after 43 years of marriage. However, if you have the tools and skills to be really committed to being deeply honest with your partner, really, really practicing, really telling the truth about what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're doing, really being connected to another human being requires skill sets to learn how to manage your own emotions and how to be able to hold the space for your partner. And when you have a bunch of partners, 
it can get pretty complicated. Yeah. So what I say about polyamory, it's not um, for the faint of heart. Some people get into it for the wrong reason. They're like, oh, I'm not really cut off, cut out for one relationship. I'm really polyamorous. Well, you know what? You need relationship skills. Even lab rats need relationship skills to get laid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the thing is, is, and I always say this, polyamory is really difficult. Relationships are really difficult. You just have to choose your difficult, right? And that might sound contrived, but I think a lot of people just assume like it's a big sex party fuck fest and that can be the case sometimes. But then you also, if you're in the type of polyamory that's relationship based, uh, it's, you don't just have one partner and one partner's set of feelings and emotions and, and sort of things that you're dealing with. Now you've got multiple and they have multiple too. And so it can get very sticky. I want to ask, uh, a lot of things, but I, what I want to ask first is what drew you and your husband to the polyamory to, to, to try, was it something you just wanted to try? You guys were curious, you guys were bored. I mean, what, what happened? That's a great question. I think it was a combination of two things looking back on this. So we were in our, this is 30 years ago when this started in our lives. So uh, looking back, I think it was a combination of we'd been through a lot. We had gone through um, creating relation, the relationship. We got married. We had a family. We had dealt with my son had uh, uh, needed open heart surgery. There was a lot of stress in our lives. And we're living in the suburbs and we're not feeling very connected to other people. So we found like going out for dinner and talking about the marvelous food or, you know, like, oh, I just bought this car. And my husband and I were bored to death with that kind of stuff. We had our old friends, which, you know, like my high school and my grammar school friends. Well, we met a couple and we actually met the couple through my daughter when she was in kindergarten. Her little friend had parents and they pursued it with wow. us. So they were like kind of the doorway. And I think we actually kind of fell in love with them. We definitely had new relationship energy with them. I wanted to contribute to their lives. They were struggling with the relationship. They were having issues with their kids. I thought like, wow, this is really cool. First of all, I can have <laughs> sex with this guy and my life didn't fall apart. My husband could have sex with her, sometimes we'd have sex all together and, you know, like we were okay. Nothing terrible happened. It kind of gave us a feeling of possibility. Okay. So, you know, like once you've, once an acorn becomes a tree, you can't really go back into the acorn. Right. So after that relationship ended, my husband and I, both of us have been like the kind of people who are interested in human development and growth. And so we were kind of enjoying the fact that we could be deeply connected on lots and lots of levels with people to be intimate emotionally. Plus we could have <laughs> sex and it was so much fun to explore ourselves like that. Did you find that it strengthened your relationship with your husband or were there, I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess that's the question. And then I have a follow-up question. It can strengthen the relationship if, and this is a big caveat, if you do the work. So regular monogamy, it, you know, there's sort of assumptions that you make, you know, that you don't have to work so hard at. In polyamory, when you have all of this like new relationship energy and you have temptations and you're, you need to be able to learn how to ground yourself enough and be committed. And I'm going to say this about relationship. I love doing relationship coaching. It's a big part of my practice. You need to be committed to the growth of the partner, mm. not to the status quo of the relationship. I love that. I love that because in my relationship now, it was the first time in my life and, and, you know, maybe I was a shitty boyfriend, right? Or whatever. But uh, it was the first time in my life that I was with a partner when her and I got together that the idea of her being successful, being more successful than me, even like, and like her, her and I standing in the kitchen, I would have this fantasy It was almost a sexual fantasy of like, 
her telling me, you know, about her day and like what, where she's headed in her life and this, and, and like, it just fucking like made me horny to see her successful in my mind. And she's already successful on her own, but that was a big piece of it because I'd always fantasized about having a partner instead of a girlfriend. Right. So, so you're committed to each other's success and, some, and growth. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and sometimes all that means is that you just listen and and if you're asked to give advice, you give advice or whatever. And then sometimes it's just it's just being there for the other person and caring and not trying to be the one who's controlling everything. And so I totally get what you mean by you have to be committed to the success and growth of your partner if you want a successful relationship. And I'm assuming since we're on sex party, right, uh, that that can mean sexually, too. Yes, that can mean sexually, too, if you guys are on the same page. I love to hear that you're interested in listening. Mm. One of the big issues I think that we're having culturally across the board is the rush to judge. And people have the shortest attention span. They're always on their phones. I write about this in my book, (laughs) which hijacks the brain in a bad way. If you can really hold the space to listen to your partner. In fact, my husband and I are in the middle now of developing content, a training series for people, video series on how to do what we call core listening, listening all the way down and holding the space for your partner to actually hear themselves. So instead of the rush to judge, the rush to influence, the rush to control, Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are trying to control Mm -hmm. because they're coming from, as I write about in my book, a lot of inflammation in the defenses, Mm -hmm. very, very afraid, panicky, sometimes hot tempered, you know. So the ability to, as a human being, to tolerate our own feelings, which essentially are really embodied. That's the point of my book. We have seven core embodied emotional systems that serve as our instincts to go into the world, to to meet our needs. If we can get savvy enough to be able to tolerate the sensations in our bodies, the thoughts in our minds, the feelings, and actually We think that we're thinking beings that feel sometimes. We're actually feeling beings that think sometimes. Feelings are the lead story. Whether people want to recognize it or not, it's shaping what we pay attention to. It shapes how we behave. Emotions loom large. So the fact that you can listen, Dustin, and that you can get turned on by your partner's Development, you know, my husband has a saying, he's very cute. He says, if you're really paying attention, you can't fuck the same woman twice because you're growing, you're learning. I love that. You're developing. Yeah. You know, I'm with, and, and the thing is, is that if you are committed to the growth of your partner rather than your own discomfort, you might be able to hang out long enough and listen to them enough to support them when you truly have that kind of supportive partner. Where the fuck do you want to go? Yeah. What could be better than that? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like, if you guys are getting out the whiteboard together and making a plan that includes her stuff and your stuff or their stuff and your stuff, that's a whole other thing. And then that leads to better to, in my experience, which is limited, right? Obviously. But, um, uh, you know, it, it, um, it leads to better sex and then down, down through there, right? It leads to like better conversations, better understanding. If there is an argument, then maybe it's not as loud and it ends quicker, right? Because yes. you've had these side conversations where it's like, well, I'm not going to attack the person who is, you know, devoting time to listening and, and plotting out on a whiteboard how we build our individual empires. You know, you see these memes and shit online all the time, like, you know, be this and be that and help them build their empires. And you know, what's funny is a lot of that's bullshit, but at the same time, you know, there's, there is a, a, a dream component to it. That's true. I mean, I think if you can find someone that is just as interested at you 
you know, recording your hundredth episode of your podcast or like nailing this thing and not in a way where it's like, Oh, that's nice, sweetie. But like, they're like, fucking go, let's go. Like, you know, and, and I think that is, that is the key for me personally at this stage of my life to, to having relationships that are real and fulfilling and not just like, because the other way, and I had been in a lot of relationships where this was attempted is one of the partners is always trying to control the other one. And that's like this weird sort of pre-programmed bullshit thing we do where like the woman tries to stop the the man from hanging out with his friends and no more video games. And the man is like, why would you wear something like that? No. Like, why do you need to go out with your girls? Why would you go to that bar? Did that guy look at you? Like, I don't understand. And, and obviously you're a doctor and I'll shut the fuck up so you can talk. <laughs> Um, but maybe you could explain why we go to that instead of going to the partnership. Fear. Okay. The way we're wired. Okay. There's these systems that come fully wired when we're actually born. And one of the systems is fear. So what we fear when we're in fear, we are trying to control. There's another system called panic grief that gets activated when we feel there's a threat to our relationship. And a lot of people suffer from fear and insecurity. So it's actually, when you think about love, love is a choice. Love is not this chemical thing that happens in your brain, (laughs) okay? Although we like that part and that can get our attention on people enough to do the work of bonding. Love is a choice that we can choose to be committed to the partner's growth. We could think about the keen interest that people have when they're first dating, right? Mm -hmm. What if we learn the skills to think about instead of having a relationship, which is, you know, is going to, we negotiate it and then it has to be that way. (laughs) If we continue to relate to each other and we, we soothe ourselves enough We develop the skills and the tools. I write about my book, about how you can, and I work with a lot of people. People read my book and then they reach out and they go, you know, I'd like to do some actual work on these things. There's tools in the book, but if we can calm ourselves enough, soothe ourselves enough to feel secure, we can tolerate our partners being separate from us. And when people are separate from us, they're really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The separ- the separateness, we really want to feel connected and separate. And people that have that secure attachment style or who develop that ability to do it, then they can hold the space for the for their partner to really be a separate human being and get to have agency and autonomy. So they're not choosing from fear. They're making a conscious choice to be loving. Yeah, see, and I think... If we really drill in on that, I think what you're saying is that everybody needs to date either a sex therapist or a relationship coach. Um, No, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) But somebody who, because when you can be out and alone and on your own and with your friends and with your family and not have to check in every seven and a half minutes or whatever, and then you can come home or reconnect via text with that person. And it's this, you are sort of like this duality of you have your freedom to do whatever it is you want, go to the gym, have some drinks, do whatever, and you're trusted. And then you can come back and reconnect to your little love source. Um, there's so much room there and there's so much interest there to, to grow. Cause if you do everything together, right. It gets, it gets old after a while. And if you do everything apart, that gets old after a while. So you do kind of, you do kind of need both. Um, you mentioned your book, uh, a couple of times and I know we're touching on it here and there, but like, can we dial into your book and some of the core tenets of that? Like, um, I won't ask you to dumb it down for me, obviously. And I won't ask you to dumb it down for the audience. I would never do that, but, um, it's a podcast, right? And so if somebody, what's the elevator pitch and why, why are you so passionate about the topics you wrote about? Cause you can really tell. Well, it's really a book that teaches people to have more awareness about how their brain minds work. And the, what I unpack, which is new in psychology because psychology 
doesn't shift very quickly. Science takes a while. We, there, there is a guy, Yak Pengsept, who's actually mapped out the circuits for emotions. And these are circuits that mammals and many other animals come pre-wired to have. So if you can understand your own wiring better, you can operate it better. So what the book does is it uses our relationship with sexuality as a window into our emotional brain, our overall working brain, and gives us tools to understand. Like when you say you can't, not everybody can, you know, hook up with a relationship <laughs> specialist or a sex therapist, but if you can find a conscious partner, there are people out there who are interested in learning about themselves and developing as people. Conscious partners are the kind of people who can have successful relationships, not necessarily because they read all these books or they study all this stuff. They just have the open mind to listen and learn mm -hmm. with their partners. So in my book, I talk about the pleasure crisis. And this was, I wrote this before COVID. It's only gotten worse. We are suffering from an epidemic of something called anhedonia, which means the inability to experience satisfying pleasures, which is in part due to how we use our attention. So we divide our attention constantly. We're on our phones a lot. We don't actually do things the way that the brain works well. Like the brain is wired to actually respond to having somebody in the flesh or even like what we're doing now, we're seeing each other, we're talking to each other, we're not in the same room, but you can connect and listen and pay attention to each other. So we're in this pleasure crisis. We have soaring rates of, for, for once now, anxiety is actually more prevalent than depression. And the digital the, the digital natives, the phone generation, the kids that grew up on phones are really having a hard time. They are so dysregulated. And if you look at our country, there's a lot of dysregulation going on. I mean, historically, there's always been this kind of craziness on and off. But we are at such a bad place where people are not really enjoying what feels good and is good for us, which is real connection. People just aren't even having all that much sex anymore. Right. The sexual recession is real. Yeah, it is. Not everybody is experiencing it. And I hope that people who are tuning in watch the show <laughs> and listen to the podcast because they are aligned with the idea that sex feels good and is good for you. Mm -hmm. And being sex positive and having an open mind is a great way to move through the world. So my book is really like a, basically like a, uh, a guide for people how to work with their brain minds more effectively. And putting a focus on pleasure is a very, very important piece of working the brain mind well. No, I love that. I mean, and I love that you wrote about something that's happening in real time almost because, you know, what happened because I just had someone on the show and um, she was also a sex therapist and we talked about how we are having less sex since the pandemic overall. Uh, at the same time, there's like sex parties and polyamory and um, kink and BDSM that that seems to be going up while sex overall is going down. And I guess the willingness to talk about those things. So where, I mean, again, giant question and like you know you're in a cannon about to be shot out over 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 the water right so like not a lot of time to uh to you know save the world here but where are we headed if we stay on this path we need to be in our bodies if we're not paying attention to our bodies we're not going to be good citizens and good partners right so when i say be in our body People are in their heads most of the time. If we continue to be in our heads like we are, mm -hmm. we're going to be so dysregulated, not just as individuals, but going down this dark hole of dysregulation in this country. Because the truth of the matter is, is most people are really good people. Most people 
would in a situation where they're in the flesh would that be helpful sure. would actually not want a puppy to get shot. And I'm making a reference to the crazy Republicans that think that that's okay to shoot a dog. Most people will do the right thing and not write about if, it in their book. If they shoot their dog. Yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. And certainly, and certainly, you know, it, it's just so sad. It's, it's weird. It's so weird. But the thing is, if you are in your body and you're paying attention to sensations in the body, you're not going to want to do anything to harm anybody else. Cause empathic people, most people are normal in the sense that they have empathy. Mm -hmm. They're going to feel uncomfortable making somebody else hurt. Yeah. So I think that the key to all of this, whether it's sex, relationships, politics, is to be focused on being tuned into your sensations in your body enough to be able to regulate your emotions and make good choices and good decisions on your behalf and toward the collective. Sure. No, I mean, great, great worded advice, great advice, right? Um, let's, let's bake it down till it's just a, a syrup, like all over the place. Let's, let's give a real example. Um, uh, where do I come up with this stuff? But, um, uh, uh, <laughs> sometimes I just like surprise myself. Um, and that's the best part. Um, no, but like how, in a real world example, say somebody is out there. Uh, Cause a lot of times I find myself scrolling Instagram and TikTok, and I'm like, I don't even want to be doing this, but I don't even know what else. I'm like compelled. I'm addicted. I'm like, you know what I mean? And, and I catch myself and usually try to reel it back in, but let's say there is someone like me out there, but let's say they don't have a partner and you know, they, they are addicted to social media. Like the rest of us are their attention span is shot. They don't want to read the full email. So they skim it. Um, they haven't been with, you know, with another person in a couple of years, but they, they feel that urge to connect with somebody sexually, emotionally, they have a fear around it because of the pandemic and politics and people shooting their dogs and like whatever. Right. And TikTok and the smiley face serial killers will just throw them in there too, but they're nervous. They're freaked. <laughs> they're freaked out. You want them to be in their body. What's a real world example of a starting point uh, where they can okay. start to, to really kind of from, from, you know, from step one. Step one is to notice that you have a body and your body is breathing. So my work, and I write a lot about this in the book, the first thing that people need to learn how to do is to be able to have an influence over their nervous system. Most people, most of us, most of the time are living in flight or fight mm -hmm. or freeze. And, you know, look, we all like look at these things. There are people who get paid a lot of money to make this addictive. So when what happens is this kind of stuff gets its hooks into the places in your brain that are predicting rewards and are predicting your behaviors and are actually getting sort of hijacking what would ordinarily be the seeking desire to connect with another human being. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would say to anybody is, Take a moment, put your phone down just for a little bit and notice that you have a body. For example, feel that you're breathing and something is simple and simple, simple, simple as making your exhalation just a little bit longer than your inhale. So if you're breathing in one, two, three, four, you're exhaling one, two, three, four, five, or maybe six. What that does is it gives your body the message that you are safe. So a lot of what people are responding to is feeling fear, feeling distress, and kind of hooking into social media as a way of feeling something, you know, kind of connecting up to something that puts itself in the place of what we would be having if we were having real pleasures and real connections. Right. So the person who's not connected in the world, the first place is to just like take a moment, feel your sit bones in the chair, make your breath a little bit longer 
then your exhalation, and then kind of start to ask yourself a couple of questions like, what do I really want? What's going on in my mind? What's happening in my body? And what's my emotional weather? So giving people some tools for self-attunement helps them separate from these, you know, algorithms on the devices <laughs> and kind of come into the body. Yeah. So, and then the next thing I always say to people is find one friend, one person, just one person that you can really connect with and get curious and interested in that person, one person at a time. Yeah. And you know what the good news is, Dustin, is that we are actually wired in a way where we can rebalance. Human beings are incredibly resilient when we can tap into our resources and our resilience. And then like in my book, talk about fostering the affiliative feelings, care. Mm. The care system runs on our own opioids, our bodies. This is a medicine cabinet right here. We make our own feel-good peptides, the opioids, that when those systems are working, it's with and through good connections with other people that we feel a sense of well-being. And then if we can get curious, if we can take back some of our dopamine from, so, from social media and start getting curious, just curious about ourselves and each other, have a conversation with somebody, a real conversation, an authentic, what's on your mind, what's going on in your body, what's your emotional weather. These are the tools that people can put on their tool belt that I write about in my book and I t coach people all the time mm -hmm. for this, that they can start having a more reinforcing, rewarding relationship with themselves. And then they have this natural urge to merge. That's the lust system. <sighs> that comes online. The lust system comes online when we feel safe and we feel connected. We feel care and a little side order of curiosity, which is the seeking system. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's amazing. And what, what incredible advice. I mean, and anybody could follow that if they just devote some, a little bit of time to it. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and and the stuff you read about in the book, I mean, you you were a, a therapist for 25. Were you a sex therapist for 25 years? First, I was a therapist, but I always dealt with sex. Because okay. in my mind, how do you talk to somebody without, without asking, you know, how's your love life? How's your sex life? Right. You know, it's just to me, it was a natural. Right. So then I got trained as a sex therapist. And when I was 50 years old, I had the pleasure of meeting Beverly Whipple, who was the lady who named the G-Spot. Nice. And she was doing some work with um, Barry Commissarek down at Rutgers in Newark. They asked me to join them. And my husband, who was so gracious, because I used to help him. We had my law, his law practice and my psychotherapy practice in one big office. Mm. So I said to him, sorry, honey, kids are gone. <laughs> I'll see you later. And I went off and I spent six years doing this graduate degree, mm -hmm. which was a hoot and a half, because if you think that <laughs> sex research is sexy, oh my God, <laughs> no. So I had to pilot all of my, what we knew so little in science about how the genitals connect with the sensory areas. So that was my first project. So guess who had to spend a lot of time in the fMRI scanner, <laughs> masturbating, thinking about sex, having orgasms. It was part of my day job. Mm. And you have to stay really, really still. You can't move your head. Yeah. And would you believe that when we had the lab at the medical school, everybody made excuses to come and kind of come through the lab when we were studying women. When we moved and we got our own scanner and then we started studying men. Mm. You could not get anybody to show up, including the physicist. They didn't. So I was joking. I said, if the scanner is rocking, don't come knocking. You know, so 
But one time, my favorite story, I wrote about this for the Atlantic when I was in my early 50s. I was in school and we were trying to map out where if you stimulate the anterior wall of the vagina, the front wall of the vagina with an fMRI compatible device, you can't put metal in there, you can't put batteries. So it was just this acrylic thing. Mm -hmm. And actually that day I was using a purple rubber dildo and it went flying out of the scanner. (laughs) <laughs> so here the scanner is so loud boom 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 i can't talk to the people in the control and when the scanner stops somebody <laughs> said to me how are you go houston we have a problem <laughs> so the scan <laughs> oh, God. The, the, that purple dildo it was a purple rubber dildo <laughs> was, went flying across the room so we had that's why they have the, gla- the glass there then to they're behind glass. To keep you be- behind glass. <laughs> They'll get hit with a dildo. <laughs> it was, they actually at the scanner, they rather the monkeys come down. They actually had monkeys at Rutgers that they were scanning. Wow. The fMRI. They preferred to have the monkeys in the scanner over the men. This is how sex negative. The women they thought was kind of cute, you know, <laughs> but I, so my dissertation work was I had, Women come in Mm -hmm. with their partners and actually the women donated two orgasms to science, one by self-stimulation of the clitoris and the other when it worked, which wasn't always the time. It's hard to reach into a scanner and stimulate somebody's clitoris when you can't see or talk to them. So that was what I published data on. And I actually showed that when women were fantasizing about having pleasurable stimulation, insertion of a dildo, their brains lit up, look like an orgasm. So it's a great, you know, example to, for us to know that it's the brain that's the most important sex organ. Imagery, imagining having pleasurable stimulation lights up the brain very much like actual physical stimulation. So that was my science claim to fame, those two published (laughs) papers. And uh, people used to look at me like, why? You know, Nightline. Nightline was a very famous TV show. They came to, to film my dissertation work. And this didn't go on on film. They they didn't show this on on the air. But the first thing they asked me is, "Can you tell our viewers why you are studying something like sex instead of something important Ugh. like cancer or pain?" And it's like, "Way to blow it, Nightline!" Yeah. <laughs> well, they edited that out actually, <laughs> but it was like kind of like you're always working against the tide. I probably don't have to tell you because you see that out there that people dismiss or. You know, here were these grown professors in my department when I was talking about my my participants, the women that mm-hmm. came to donate the orgasm. Somebody said, are those women exhibitionists? You know, like they make these assumptions. First of all, it wasn't very sexy. They had a special helmet that looked like a, it's scary. It looked like a, um, a Hannibal Hector Lecter, yeah. Hannibal Lecter's, you know, thing. Yeah. And you oh have to God. stay really still. And these people have, in fact, one one guy in the department saw me walking along and he goes, hey, you sex maniac. I'm like, "Wow, thank you. <laughs> That's yeah. a compliment. But people get so activated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So activated. The minute you talk about sex, People are fascinated. We have a really love hate relationship with sex in this country, and and, and pure it's puritanical still. Yeah, no, it's absolutely insane. Um, and and even doing this podcast, and I thought I I never I, I mean I I knew I would upset some people. I mean the show's called Sex Party, and let's get let's get and and my attitude <laughs> towards it's like fuck it, we're having a party, we're going for it. Everyone's <laughs> invited, let's do this thing. But I, I knew I was going to upset people, but, you know, um, lately, the last year of the show, it's a lot of death threats in the Facebook uh, oh, good. In- inbox. It's always some incel. What the fuck <laughs> is wrong with people? Uh, I don't know. I don't, yeah. yeah. yeah, That's so sad <laughs> that people get so triggered, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The number one sex problem is people can't talk about sex. Yeah. That's the number one problem. Right, and and you get the the occasional uh, bonehead that's in the comments, like, 
women shouldn't do this or that and blah, blah, blah. So like, you know, it, just go eat your cereal under a tree somewhere by yourself. You, <laughs> you don't, you don't, I mean, I appreciate the engagement and the free comment. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so, okay. How many, how many people actually climbed into the scanner and masturbated, would you say? So I would say Including over the course yourself. of, uh, well, I have, you always have to pilot your own <laughs> right. studies because you work out all of the, talk about like the things that can go wrong, except when you're, when things go wrong, there's this huge magnet that can take something like metal and pull it in, you know, and kill somebody. Mm. So you have to be real careful. Yeah. So I would say I had at least a couple of dozen people that I personally scanned probably closer to maybe 40 Mm -hmm. over the time, because sometimes we were changing the protocols and we couldn't use the data. Sometimes the machine broke down. Sometimes the person didn't have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of, uh, between the men and the women, it was a lot of, um, and, and then also people wanted to come in and film. So we generated interest. So tell, you know, BBC and yeah. Nightline and all these people came in and wanted to scan it and that we were not popular. They didn't like us at the scanner because <laughs> they were worried we were making messes. So I had to put all this kind of waterproof stuff on the scanning bed. And they're worried that they, the guys were going to get Vaseline on the controllers. Oh, my and God. There were a lot <laughs> <laughs> There were a lot of technical issues. And and I got to tell you, at the end of the day, I'm so proud that we got it done because understanding how the brain processes pleasure is intricately a part of how the brain works. Yeah. So, yeah, you can get a lot of money to study pain, but you can't get money to stay, to study pleasure. Yeah. Oh, it's, well. It's you. <laughs> Well, well, luckily we have people like you who are interested in it and will will continue to to do things, you know? I mean, yeah. w- what would you say the top 3 things that you that you learned about the brain and sex were from all this? Yeah. Well, number 1 is the brain is the most important sex organ and even just imagery can stimulate the brain in ways that we didn't realize were possible. We didn't have that map of how imagery could affect the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, orgasm, genital stimulation and orgasm is actually very good for the brain. So when a brain region gets active, actually the brain sends more oxygen to that area. That's how fMRI gives us a signal that we can measure because oxygenated blood has a different magnetic quality than unoxygenated or deoxygenated blood. So What we found was that there were so many areas of the brain that kind of got enrolled and got lots and lots of blood flow and participated in the buildup to the orgasm and then the release. And we were also able to show by looking at various brain regions that there's so many good, feel good and good for you substances that are released by the brain that it actually, you know, one of the things I think about is that sex can be like an antidepressant. Now I'm not telling people to get off their antidepressants. I would never do that. But one of the things that we don't really realize is that because the brain is its own kind of pharmacy, If we're kind of having a rough time, if we're going through periods of anhedonia or struggle or stress, something that could be a mood elevator and actually also increase testosterone is masturbating. Now, maybe you're not feeling it. Now, there are people who tell me like they're so depressed they don't feel like masturbating. Mm -hmm. What I say to them is no, there's no shoulds. I don't say you have to beat the meat. I don't tell them that, <laughs> but I'll say something like, you know what? You don't have to be in the mood. You know, if you just, for women, just get out the vibrator. It's easier for men, you know, go get the end. Sometimes just that regular um, cascading of all of those good chemicals in the brain yeah. can be stress relieving and also an antidepressant. 
Yeah. No. And it also can help people who don't feel like having sex is, a, is, is priming the pump by getting those chemicals going and actually masturbating and having sex increases your testosterone levels in both men and women. So, you know, maybe a little bit more time exploring our pleasure bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And more, more time being connected. And, and what I'd say is that, you know, I know there are people who have challenges with too much masturbation and too much, uh, you know, I, I just wrote a piece about, compulsive sexual behavior disorder rather than sex addiction. Sex addiction is a really tough thing because people throw that label on anybody who wants to do anything that's the least bit kinky right, or different than <laughs> their agenda. However, I would say that we need to, coming back to being in our bodies and focusing on pleasure. So that's the third thing. So number one, the brain is the most important sex organ of all. Number two, uh, genital stimulation orgasm is good for the brain. It gets a lot of blood flow. It's somebody wrote in one of the pieces about better than crossword puzzles or Sudoku when they were talking about our research. And, um, you know, <laughs> what a great compliment from the, from this day and age for this day. Yeah, and age, though. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. And number three, like be in your body, right? hang out in your body and connect with other people. Face to face, flesh to flesh. And you know, it's also a real issue for the younger people. And I sound like an old person, but I am. Texting is not a replacement for a phone call. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. When you hear a voice and you can tell the voice, you hear the tone of the voice, there's something called the, the um, it's the vagal, social vagus nerve that, comes through the ear, he, listening to a person's voice actually can downregulate the nervous system in a way. Plus, you can't understand when somebody is texting what they're really, what their yeah. context is, what do they really mean? I don't care There's how many no emojis tone. you yeah. use. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people have to, people need to talk more and to listen better. Yeah. Listen better. I mean, there's ASMR out there, you know what I mean? Where it's like someone's, mm -hmm. someone's talking like this and they're, uh, you know, or whatever. And that it, it does bring, bring, um, and, and I would say, you know, that's, <clears throat> that's a super move that even if you haven't elevated your situation or relationship to like talking on the phone all the time, um, what I like to do is send voice notes because then boom, right? Then the person's like, oh shit, okay, or whatever. Or like- They can really hear you yeah. and hear what you mean. Right, yeah. right. And yeah. if and if you're, and <laughs> I always, I try to work in the, the FaceTime usually when I meet, meet somebody to make sure they're a real person. That's what I used to yeah. do on the dating apps. But yeah. I found that uh, if they don't want to FaceTime and they don't want to talk, you're probably not talking to someone that you want to meet in person. <laughs> and the seeing a person mm -hmm. and looking at a person, there's a whole kind of synchrony, even over something virtual, if you're actually looking and talking, that has this connection with the emotional brain mm -hmm. that actually is very good. And what we're seeing with the younger people, the Gen, the Gen Z, it, it takes into your mid to late 20s for the full development of the frontal capacities. Mm -hmm. And these kids are not get their brains are not developing the capacity to self-regulate, which is where they're, they're having so many problems. It's interfering with brain development. We need to see, we need to talk, we need to touch, we need to connect. Well, can you go talk to Congress or something? I mean, I feel like, like, uh, you know, if this, if this generation is really headed off a cliff in that way, where, now we're going to we're going to put on the headset and we're going to put on the gloves right and we're going to go mm -hmm. and have sex with artificial intelligence you know things that we <laughs> that we create or whatever i mean it does feel pretty doomy here right right now you know well here's the good news again like i said most people are pretty good mm -hmm. and the next generations as much as there some of them are impeded and hobbled to some extent with technology, there are people who are already trying to work around and solve this. Right. So I have great faith in the majority of people. I think there's going to be challenges. There's always been, and if you look over through history, I mean, 
when they invented the automobile, they thought that was the going to be the end of civilization because people were going to go in cars and have sacks. Oh, wow. So, but you know, it's, but the thing is, there is something to be said. There's a, a fastness to how things are, are going now. Mm -hmm. Synchronicity, not synchronicity. What was the word? Where, where our knowledge, our technology is going beyond our ability to manage it. There's a word for that. Right. Um, so what I would say is be kind and connect with the person. Oh, you want, you want to feel better really fast? Every day go outside and go out and get some sunlight into your eye. Sunlight goes right through the eye to the back of the retina, to the hypothalamus, which is the major systems of everything. We spend too much time sitting. We spend too much time indoors. Move your body, get some sunlight. Yeah. And tune into your body channel and get into your sensations. And then life can be pretty sensational. Well, I don't think there's any better way to end it. And as a podcaster, as a host, I'm going to take that as the best ending and and take the owl right now. Dr. <laughs> Nan, Nan Wise, thank you so much for being with me on Sex Party. I want to um, tell everyone, I want you to tell everyone where they can find you on social media if you're there, where they can purchase the yeah. book, where they can pre-order the second book, um, whatever other channels you had. How can they work right. with you? Because I feel like people are going to want to work with you after this. So for a good time, all you have to do is Google Ask Dr. Nan, my website, which the, all the letters of doctor, D-O-C-T-O-R. Okay. People can get a free consult with me. Just sign up on the website. You can book your own consult with me for free. I love to talk to people. And a lot of times, sometimes people are just missing a little bit of information. So it doesn't even... I don't even end up having to do sessions with everybody who reaches out to me. My book's available. Any place you buy books on Amazon, Why Good Sex Matters. It's available as a Kindle, a hard copy, and Audible. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't, I'm still working on the second book, but you can follow me, Ask Dr. Nan, on Instagram and Facebook and um, feel free. Anybody who wants to just kind of talk to me, just book a, a consult. I'd love to chat. And Dustin, let me know how I can be in support of you going forward. You, I think it's wonderful what you're doing. Thank you so much. Seriously. No, it means a lot. Seriously. I, mean, I think it, it's wonderful what you're doing. So um, Thank you. I will make sure everything is linked below we will funnel a bunch of weirdos just kidding i'm <laughs> just joking <laughs> I, we, we love the weirdos the i'm the weirdo job. i have the best job in the world i get to talk to that with people about their intimate they privilege me yeah. with trusting me enough to tell me about the intimate details of their lives and it's just you know my heart and, and you know it's so nice to know that most of the time the vast majority of people who reach out to me Really, you're just looking for a little guidance, yeah. you know. I, I just, I have the best, best clients. I have the best followers, and um, <laughs> I love, I love connecting. So, thank you for this opportunity. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure having you on. I was just kidding about the weirdos. I love the weirdos. You know, like the, <laughs> we're all, we're all weird. We should stay weird, and I think maybe you can help us stay weird. So, weird is wonderful. It is. It really weird is. Weird is wonderful. We want to be encouraging people's ability to celebrate their authentic totally selves. yeah the weirder yeah. the better i'm normal yeah. is so so boring um the normals, 100 <laughs> iq is normal yeah right? well <laughs> says who um no i i loved having you on and i would love to have you back because there's a bunch of topics we didn't we didn't cover I'm so be we'll, happy to yeah we'll have to set that up but uh Thank you so much for being with me this week on the show. My pleasure. And if you want me to come back and give um, really good uh, lowdown on what we've learned from research about what skills work in effective relationship, that's a really, really great topic. And it's really not hard. We just need to know how to do it. Yeah, no, let's do it. Once, once we disconnect, I'll talk to you about... Uh, okay. Once I stop this recording, I'll talk to you about booking back <laughs> in. <laughs> thank, All right. Thank Peace you so out, much. Peace out, Nova. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Dustin. See you soon. Big thank you to my guest, Dr. Nan Wise, for being with me on the show this week. Go show her some love and appreciation. Go follow her on Instagram. 
uh, Facebook, go buy her book, book a consult with her. It's free chat with her. <clears throat> she's lovely. She's incredibly smart. And I think she's doing a lot for sex and sexuality and health. Uh, if you're loving guests like Dr. Nan Wise, you want to see her again because she will be back. But you're just loving Sex Party and you want to keep appreciating the show. What can you do to show some devotion, right? If you're listening to this on platforms like Apple and Spotify, you could leave a rating. You could leave a review, sure. But what you really want to do is you want to make sure you're subscribed to the show. That way you get a new episode every single Wednesday and you don't miss out on all this awesome shit, right? If you are watching on YouTube, I love you. I see you. I appreciate you. If you are watching on YouTube, would you climb into any kind of mechanical medicinal machine like an MRI machine and masturbate in it uh, in the name of science? Um, let me know in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you could like this video. You could like all the videos. You could leave a comment. But again, what you really want to do is you want to make sure that you're subscribed to the channel so you never miss a new episode every single Wednesday till the end of time. As always, I'm available in the DMs on Instagram, and I will see you all right back here next week. Thanks for listening. The party continues next week. Click subscribe and let's make this a regular thing. Follow the show on Instagram and Twitter at SexPartyFM. Follow Dustin at Dustin Ribka.